Good. So, uh, welcome to the first meeting of uh, February. <laughs> so, for the um, specialized working group, it's uh, part of the SDNCF. So, we're here to the um, guidelines and uh, community uh, terms of that. So, sorry, I lost the word. <laughs> um, yeah. And today on the agenda, we have Unicraft presenting, right? So do you have, uh, do you guys have slides or? Yeah, I have some slides. Um, I don't, I don't know how long this slot is, but I don't need a whole lot of time either. So you know, should I just share? Yeah, yeah. If, um, if you're able to, sure. Okay. Can you see that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, as I said, I think no more than, I don't know, max 10 minutes. Um, basically, I'll give a, a brief description of uh, Unicraft and Unikernels in case you don't know. And then Craft Cloud is basically essentially a cloud platform that we built around that technology. Uh, so I did this presentation in front of the crowd. I mean, I was doing a bit of a, an icebreaker and some quiz time. So maybe we can do this. Um, you know, what's the fastest you can boot a virtual machine on a x86 server? Um, and so I had this following options, uh, minutes, seconds, milliseconds, who wants to take a guess? I guess in this group, you probably know the, the right order of magnitude, but uh, you'd be amazed out there how many people just said minutes is the norm, right? Um, so feel free to interrupt me or I'll just keep going because uh, this is a bit of a savant group when it comes to these things, right? Okay, um, and then I also asked how many virtual machines can I stuff into a 64 core server? And um, I mean, the highest number I got from a 700 person crowd was 200 or something like that, right? Um, so I'll, I'll come back to this uh, later on. So um, basically, one example we take is we we grab Nginx, and if you go on AWS and you take an AMI for with Ubuntu, it's it's pretty sizable, which is great for AWS because you, then you take an amazingly large uh, EC2 instance to run it, and you give them a lot of money, and everything works, and everybody's happy, right? And but what we were saying is if you look at Nginx, the actual binary is pretty small; it's a couple of megs, so. Um, couldn't we build an image uh, that where most of the memory consumption and resources, like 90% go to the application and not to the rest of the stuff underneath? And that's what Unicraft is trying to do, right? So if you build uh, Unicraft with Nginx, you get an image that's uh, it's a couple of megs in size. Um, obviously, image size is not the only KPI. Um, things that you can also improve are memory consumption, uh, boot times, and so forth compared to Linux. So uh, I guess you know what a unikernel is. It's essentially a super specialized uh, virtual machine uh, tailored to the needs of each of the different applications. So you can do things like um, DCE at compile time. You can get rid of a lot of libraries, especially if you can use a sort of modular operating system where it's really easy to remove things you don't need. Um, then you can really build uh, images that are an order of magnitude smaller uh, but still the application is unmodified and to the outside world, it still looks like a virtual machine, right? So uh, I guess this is a slide that makes sense outside of this group. Inside this group, I suppose you kind of know these sort of stacks. Uh, the most typical stack in the cloud is like this third one where people sort of say, oh, I go to the public cloud and I just have a very lean container, right? But Turns out their lean container is a massive container and underneath there's anyways a virtual machine on, uh, to, to make sure that it's properly isolated, right? So ideally what you want is this fourth stack here. You want your application as close to the hardware as possible or close to the VMM and the, the, the hypervisor as possible. And that's what we try to do with, with Unikernels. So uh, Unicraft is a Linux Foundation open source project. You can go to unicraft.org and uh, get get started uh, for free. We try to put a lot of effort into documentation and hopefully making it a bit easier. There'll be an announcement next week. Uh, we've sort of simplified workflows a lot. Uh, there's four of them going on this weekend, so there'll, there'll be announcements coming soon. Um, 
now a little bit more detail. So Unicraft uh, three principles. The first one is uh, we wanted it to be fully modular. So it's not a monolithic operating system because we wanted to be able to allow for specialization. The, the second part is that uh, we wanted to keep uh, POSIX and Linux API compatibility. So unlike a lot of projects, we don't require any modifications to the actual applications and languages. At most, we may uh, set some config par parameters uh, in the application and that's it. And then uh, we do spend time doing tooling integration with things like Docker and, and Kubernetes and Terraform. I'm not really going to cover that today, but if you're interested, let me know. Um, in terms of the, the compatibility I mentioned, um, Unigraph supports basically two paths. Uh, one we call roughly auto-porting and the other one is uh, binary compatibility. So on the left-hand side, essentially what we're doing is uh, we build the application in Linux against the muscle, and then we take the resulting object files and then we link it into a Unicraft image where we provide our own uh, muscle uh, library. And then from there, uh, we have a syscall shim layer in Unicraft, which is a library as well that you can enable. And then underneath come a bunch of syscalls, each of the syscalls being redirected to a bunch of other Unicraft libraries, uh, depending on the needs of the application, right? So that's one path. Um, the other path, which we call binary compatibility, this is where you basically build uh, an unmodified ELF in Linux, and then we just kind of grab that, we slap it into a Unicraft uh, unikernel image that includes a special library, which is an ELF loader, and then we trap the syscalls and then the same path as before. Uh, the idea being that uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you don't need to do any porting or any modification, or you don't even need the, the source code of, you, you can just take a binary. In the early days of Unicraft, we were doing a lot of manual porting. So grabbing the sources of, say, Nginx and trying to mesh the build system of Nginx into, or the files of Nginx into the Unicraft build system. Uh, there's still a bunch of images that are can be built like that in Unicraft, but obviously that's a lot of porting effort. OK, so uh, those are the basics. By the way, in interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, and then based on that, we've been putting together what we call the, the millisecond cloud platform. Um, essentially, uh, as you can imagine, uh, based on unikernels, this means that the semantics of the platform are in milliseconds, like you'd expect something like Lambda, for instance, but without cold boots, without memory restrictions, without duration restrictions, right? So because everything is still a standard VM ultimately. So uh, if you go to craft.cloud, you get this sort of landing page. Right now we're in closed beta, so you can just sign in and we give you a token and then you can, you can go on there. Um, the little sort of console example gives you a little bit of what the flow is like, but essentially you just sort of install the, the craft CLI that this is one workflow, which is the easiest. It installs on Mac OS, Linux or Windows. You export the token that, that we give you when you, when you sign up. And then there's a bunch of commands, but you can do one-liners where you just, in this case, uh, we're deploying a, a caddy web server with a one-liner. And then um, in this case, it's an example that's showing, uh, what is it, uh, Nginx booted in eight milliseconds. Um, and then the other the other features are, you know, you can, you can enable auto scale if you need it. So basically uh, you can say whenever my one instance goes over 50% CPU, it'll in, in a few milliseconds uh, track uh, peak traffic and then scale back down to zero when it's no longer needed. Okay, so um, basically uh, GraphCloud is essentially mostly KVM underneath. Uh, we use Firecracker as the, the VMM with a few modifications. Uh, we have a special controller um, as you can imagine, there was nothing off the shelf that could uh, control these instances in milliseconds and, and sort of scale up to thousands of them. Uh, so we had to do something from scratch that was relatively performant. Uh, you can imagine if you've ever done kubectls, for instance, those things take a while, just the control plane takes a while. So that would have killed all of our nice sort of boot time um, performance. Uh, we do have an image registry and then of course come the, the unikernels on top. Okay, so uh, that's for the basics. Um, we did a, so a number of performance measurements some months ago. Um, for the first one, basically we wanted to measure cold boot times, in this case with an Nginx image, 
uh, starting. So what we're doing here is we're doing one cold boot time, we measure it, then we, we leave that instance running, we start a second one, we measure that cold boot time and so forth all the way up to 5,000. And you can see it's relatively stable uh, between five and 15 milliseconds. Um, that was just Nginx, but you get uh, similar values if you're using other applications like Redis SQLite. Node.js, obviously uh, heavier. Uh, so you're looking at 50 milliseconds, but still um, an order of magnitude faster than what you could expect in Linux. And Linux, we're trying to be fair. We're using Alpine and we're trying to sort of trim it down as much as we can. Uh, another uh, side thing that you probably imagined is that the TCB of these images, the number of lines of code that we actually deploy for each image gets smaller. Uh, so this hopefully means uh, fewer vectors for attack. Um, I'm not going to cover this a whole lot, uh, but uh, throughput gets improved by the fact that we don't have um, actual system goals or user kernel space divide and that the, the stack from application down to the hardware is, is, is smaller. So this helps IO performance. Um, we did a bit of a stress test also to see how many virtual machines we could stuff, how many of these unikernels we could stuff on a, on a server. Um, in this case, it was a one terabyte of memory server, and then we just kind of let it run forever more or less, and it got close to uh, about 100,000. Now, clearly you would never do this in production, but it, it was kind of a cool test and it gives you an idea of how far you can push this, right? Okay, let me just skip that. Uh, image sizes I already mentioned. So, um, you know, roughly an order of magnitude smaller with Unicraft than you would with a, a Docker container. And uh, that's about it. As I said, about, about 10 minutes. Um, Hopefully it made sense uh, and uh, not too boring. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Felipe, uh, yeah. the last slide is here. Can you explain where the difference comes between the Docker images and if you can uh, bring it up again? Yeah. I mean, I understand that in, in a unikernel, most of the things you get in the image is your, your binary, but that's this could be the same in a Docker image if you start from scratch, for example. So where does the difference come from? Yeah. Um, so I think that, that com particular comparison was, uh, uh, I, I think it was probably from, from shared libraries uh, between the Docker image and other mm. stuff. Mostly what that, that comparison, what really matters ultimately though, is that when you go to the public cloud, your your Docker container gets wrapped in a VM underneath, and then you know obviously that that's what ultimately uh, kills your performance mm -hmm. or the fact that you need a bigger EC2 instance to run it. That probably matters more than the actual image size on disk, right? I, I don't think image size on disk is something that matters to a whole lot of people, mm -hmm. unless you start getting to image sizes of several gigs, and then distribution and other other things creep in. Uh, okay. Makes sense. And another question I had is, okay, let's say someone is very uh, uh, convinced in using uh, containers and let's say they have workflows. <clears throat> Would it make sense to try to make the VMs that run uh, the container runtime smaller to explain myself? If I was to run containers, yeah. Would it make sense to use, is there a unikernel that runs a container runtime that I could use to run my container still keeping the VM small? Or does yeah, it it, it, it's a good question. For sure, there's uh, there's people trying to make it so that you have a standard Linux VM that is as lean as possible, such that it can run containers and containers only. So that's one approach that exists. Uh, your question is, could you sort of take that on steroids and make a, a unikernel that can run any container, right? Yeah. And um, the answer is, in principle, yes. Um, what happens then is that it's not so much the container rather than what you would do at that point really is uh, maybe a compile time. The, the best thing you can do is uh, look at the container, uh, look at the binary, like the actual applications and things it needs to run and kind of unikernelize it before you deploy it. Because, you know, in a sense, you already get an isolation from the VM and the container for deployment is not doing anything for you really. Um, so, but either way, it boils down to 
uh, the system calls that you need to support. You know, what's inside the container and what are all the applications that are running and what system calls do they need? And does the unikernel environment support all of that, right? So, uh, you know, Linux has in the, anywhere in the order of 350 to 400 system calls, right? Um, obviously, a lot of things that run on the public cloud and servers don't need a bunch of them. Um, uh, it really, your mileage varies, but once you get in the order of 150 to 200 syscalls, you start being able to run a lot of really complex things that you want to run in the public cloud. Um, so yeah, the, the a, a somewhat longer term goal is that we we were we are able to take uh, you know things from the Docker registry, auto convert them to Unicraft image, and then go for deployment. And all of that should be transparent to the user. And the only thing they should notice is that the KPIs get better, right? All of a sudden they need less memory or they can use smaller EC2 instances. That's certainly a goal. The only caveat is, uh, you know, will there at this moment, of course, there will be some applications that will use some syscalls with some parameters that we do not yet support. And so it will not work 100% for all, for all Docker registries and uh, entries and all applications. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I guess let's follow on from from that line of question. I have a couple of different places I wanted to I want to ask questions, but from there, um, the the talk about the I guess the difference in your mind between sort of the origin of Demetrius question of like, can you run a container runtime on Unikernel and then just have the containers running versus the I can you know uh, craft cloud pull uh, a docker registry image auto convert and run yep. um like why, why one versus the other or or kind of how are those how, how do you trade off those, that yeah so we, we could do both i mean the the tooling part we it's not so difficult and we have most of the pieces there either path will converge to the same tricky item which is how much of the linux a api you have supported no, no, I don't. In I don't mean the namespacing and all of those bits and pieces, but the actual syscalls that the application needs, which is a much bigger interface, right? So, let's say if if I make a pie chart of the size of the challenge, the tooling integration part, we most we mostly done actually, and that's like five to ten percent of the challenge. And the other ninety percent is compliance with the Linux API, and of that eighty percent, we've basically done like 80% that gets us the most popular things that you might want to run in terms of languages and applications on the cloud. But the other, the last 20% where you can say, oh, I can auto convert anything, right? <laughs> um, you know, that's longer term. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense. Um, and then on, uh, so the, the well, slide 55 that I can still see there, that, that was the max density with Nginx and that you just kind of like kept spinning up firecracker VMs until until no, no more would pack in there. But there was an earlier slide that also showed kind of an increasing, uh, yeah, the cold boot time. Is this also on a single uh, a, a single physical host or is this kind of across um, the- All the tests wow. were on a single physical host. Okay, so the, the increase here over time or over number of running instances is roughly the same increase that we're seeing on that lower yeah, yeah, it's pretty much, uh, oh. this graph is the other graph extended. It's just, it was run on a server with more memory. Um, gotcha. okay. yeah. And then um, the other place that I, I was really curious to hear kind of your thoughts is is around, right, the, the notion of, of let's, let's stick with Kubernetes terminology and use pods, right? There's a lot of workloads where either they're a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one mapping and so they never expect them to scale separately there's latency requirements. There's, a, you know, annoying tight coupling that you can't make go away because you're migrating from a monolith that you want, you know, two containers uh, or two services to be deployed kind of in lockstep side by side. How do you how do you think about that in kind of this unikernel world? Yeah, I mean, so. Well, the the first level answer is uh, you can on Craft Cloud anyways. Uh, it's entirely possible to basically bunch a bunch of applications and make sure they get deployed together on a, on a single server, right? Um, Would they be on separate separate Firecracker VMs? Is that correct? Yes. 
okay, right? Cool. And then you can you can interconnect them via what we call IDNS, but essentially they all have private IP addresses with DNS internal DNS names. And you can point uh, one at the other and so forth, and then create your service that way, right? Um, I guess maybe this is getting into potentially secret sauce or just too much detail about the craft cloud, but like right, that yeah. internal DNS is hosted on the physical machines. So, so you're still super fast and local. Yes, yes, yes. Never, never leaving the machine yes. and everything. Exactly. Yeah, there's there's uh, basically core DNS running internally. Yes. Neat. Neat. Um, when, when we were doing a bunch of the work with Firecracker initially, um, we were trying to kind of make a direct port of that notion of pods. Um, and, and so rather than taking, teasing them apart for something like Fargate, we wanted them to sort of stay together. And, and it was, um, we actually ran, ran into some fun problems to solve there, um, because right, suddenly you're putting a container runtime in the VMM, but now you need or container runtime inside the Firecracker VM rather, but now you need communication from the VMM outside the VM layer inside the firecracker vm to actually yeah. spin up all the containers and and, and um and all that what about uh i guess the last question I'll, and then i'll stop um image caching like clearly you're showing very very small images um yeah. but right in in the fullness of time goal you you want to get to you know the the machine learning training image that has yeah. you know, the, the python nltk and the entire history of the written word in it and yes how, how does that all work in in um Crack cloud, especially for those giant images. Yeah, so right now um, in the early days, we have uh, a sort of per metro registry and they're not really synced other than, you know, we can do the the tooling, the craft tooling such that it, an image can get pushed simultaneously to various metros and then just have them. That would work okay for models that are kind of read only and sort of push once and use many times mm -hmm. over. That's sort of how we're kind of, at, uh, you know, trying to find, uh, an easy solution in the beginning. We also are thinking or toying with the idea of using relying on CDNs for that, especially for images that don't change a lot and are read-only. Maybe that's the right solution to do that with. Um, but yeah, of course, here I'm showing small images uh, of, well, it, Nginx is particularly small. It's just a few megs. We do have other images that are 10, 20 megs. If you get to Node, for instance, now you're looking at images of maybe 100, 200 megs. And then it starts to matter a little bit more. Mm. Although the way we're thinking, and, and I'm happy to get any feedback on that, is that the way this works is people build those images and test them on their own CI CD system. And only when they're ready to deploy or they want to actually try them out, they will push them. So we 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 don't really think that the sort of workflow is code a few characters and then compile and send to our cloud and then try it. Because obviously, if that were the workflow, it would be a little bit painful for large images, right? Uh, no, I, I'm I, I'm more than happy to chat about this more, but I, I have been asking a bunch of questions. This is super cool. Thanks so much for for talking through all this. Thanks for listening and thanks for the questions. Hey, I had a question. Um, and sorry if I missed this, I was debugging an audio issue with Zoom, which is always fun. Uh, could you go back to the slide that had the, like the layer cake with Firecracker on it? I had a couple questions on that. Yeah, that one. Um, okay, so in this, what is the expectation of uh, isolation between the, I guess, unikernels? Um, and would you say it's like, you could be multi-tenant between those, like, you know, customer A being in U1 and customer B being in U3, or is there some sort of, like, um, you know, uh, no expectation of privacy if you're still on the same, you know, virtual machine? How do you think about that? Yeah, so um, by, by default, they're fully isolated. They're just different virtual machines, and they run, uh, you know, it's, it's a multi-tenant environment. Um, sometimes we get asked for the same tenant, you know, if I want to, I don't know, uh, run two, two things like a server, a web server and a database, do I, you know, how do I do that? I mean, the default, the easiest thing, because these things are so lightweight, is just to start two instances, right? Although sometimes people say, can I put them together inside the same one? And, uh, yes, that is possible. And another bunch of work that we did was in supporting things like fork and vfork and fork exec, which are typically uh, showstoppers for unikernels, but we've sort of uh, doing workarounds such that 
So most things that we put together, we try to run as separate threads, uh, but you know, we're making it so that we can support applications that spawn either work processes or things that kind of do a bunch of inits and then launch an init process to run things. So that's also down the pipeline. And then uh, the firecracker bit on this slide, uh, mm -hmm. is that unique to the craft cloud implementation or is that part of kind of the uni, um, uni kernel um, project in general, the open source? No, it's just the open source uh, project. The bits that we mod are a lot to do with measurements. So we like to report boot times and things of that sort. So we did some minor modifications, right? I, th I think they would be easily upstreamable if we found the time to do it. Fair enough. Cool. Thanks for the time. You're welcome. Uh, I, I, Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I just had one more since nobody else <laughs> wanted. Uh, so building the image, is that a step you do while developing, like you do, like you compile your code or what do you expect? For example, you, you try that once, you know you can convert that to a unikernel, you know you can build an image, then you keep developing your app without building images. And then as a very last step, you build your image. I mean, would the developer expect any of the changes they make to their app to break mm -hmm. the building of the image. So is it safe to not include it in your development process and wait until the last minute for CI to build the image? Or should you always compile? And if you have to compile all the time, is it that fast, like like a building of, of a Go app, for example, that you can do all the time, or does it take time? <clears throat> Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and actually, in, in my head, it's about five questions in one, right? It goes to workflows, right? What kind of workflows do we support and what are they, right? And and there's, there's multiple ones. Um, one is, um, like, if you're working in this binary compatibility, and by the way, uh, uh, for building, right? You can go on craft cloud and build via craft cloud deploy because it'll just kind of simplify a lot of the things, but you can also use the same tool craft OSS. And there's another workflow and a lot of documentation on how to build everything. I'm going to say OSS. And then, uh, on the OSS side, optionally, you can then, uh, if you want to deploy in craft cloud, do a build target and say, uh, now I want to go to craft cloud. So there's a little flag and it adds a few things so that it works on craft cloud, but you can, everything you, you, you would build on craft cloud, you can build on, on craft, uh, or Unicraft OSS anyways. Um, so one tip, one workflow you can do is, uh, in the binary compatibility mode, we're just building elves. Uh, you can just be working on your Linux environment and doing normal compilation steps. And once you're kind of happy with that via CI CD system or manually, then uh, you can sort of say, okay, now I want to combine it with uh, the Unicraft sort of rest of the Unikernel and deploy it, right? That's essentially, I mean, if you go on, on Craft Cloud, uh, we have a repo that is called examples, right? And so there's a, for instance, a subdirectory for Go. And if you go in there, uh, there's a Go sample application, like a simple Go web server. And then there's a Docker file. And the Docker file is just saying, okay, um, this is the command to compile this standard Go compilation. And then I want to slap this on top of the Go Unicraft base image. And then I want to bring in these uh, shared libraries and then please put it all together. And you can, you know, and there's just a short Docker file that, that does that. And then Craft will take that in and then sort of package that together, push it to the registry and then run it. That 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 describes a few of the possible workflows, right? Awesome, okay, thanks. So it's not something you, from what I understand, normally you wouldn't do that all the time, like single line of code, you compile, you run it. It's something more like I'm done with my changes, maybe uh, as a check in the in a pull request, for example, you, you would build the image to verify that it still works. So you don't expect breakage all the time. You don't expect it to break all the time. And if it breaks, you're saying that it's as simple as including some library or something. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. I mean, so you could do it with your own CICD system. So you have a much tighter loop. Another option is you use not Craft Cloud, but Craft Open Source, and you test it locally. So you use Kimu, for instance, and you run it locally. So you have a tighter loop there. And then maybe if you want a somewhat longer loop, you go on GraphCloud and then you deploy it. I mean, 
what takes most of the time is is the build step, right? Um, and then depending on your image size, how long it takes, depending on your connection as well, how long it takes you to push it to the registry. The actual boot is very quick, right? Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, uh, great presentation. It looks very, very interesting, actually. Um, just wanted to ask, um, I don't know, uh, I, I follow a little bit the trends uh, in the Rust community, but I don't write any Rust myself. And uh, uh, I remember, not sure if it's still the case, but there were some uh, issues uh, building with uh, Muscle C that there, it, it was for some reason a bit slower than with GDPC. Uh, have you encountered that kind of problem a lot, uh, whether it is with uh, Rust or any other type of application? And in those cases, how do you guys try to solve it? That's funny. Yeah, I mean, there are some differences between Muscle and GLibC, but I we never experienced some. Do you mean smaller to compile or smaller to actually run? Uh, I think small, it was oh, it was slower to run at the end slower of the to day, run. I think. Yeah. N not not really. I mean, we've been running uh, workloads with Muscle and GLibC for a while. We don't really notice. I mean. So the, the reason we prefer muscle is to do with uh, image sizes and memory consumption and things of that sort, right? Um, and, and and that's the only reason we, we prefer not to use glibc by default, uh, really. Um, and then in terms of the interface, there's some minor quirks or differences, although muscle tries to make it such that if there is a difference, it's supposed to be an issue or a problem that they need to solve there. They try to be as glibc compliant from the API perspective as possible. Gotcha. And, and if the user at some point needs to address something related to muscle C, uh, how, how do you guys uh, deal with that? Uh, you mean if if they want to modify uh, Muscle C themselves? Yeah, if it doesn't work for them, uh, do you oh, offer yeah, yeah, sure. an alternative or do you have to build from scratch or is not even possible? No, no, yeah, yeah. So you can build against glibc, especially in binary compatibility mode, and then that has syscalls, and then we trap those and it'll it'll work as well, yes. Very and, and, and in fact, we do sometimes have to deal with as you can imagine, we have we use heavy we make heavy use of, of GitHub Actions because we have a lot of languages and applications and things that we need to test. And some of the runners have to do with okay, there's one for Muscle and then there's one for GLibc because sometimes there's differences. Yeah. Cool. And, and just something silly, but I guess in the Mac and Windows versions, you spin up a VM, right, and then you run on top. Uh yeah 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 you mean if you're doing the local workflow yeah it's it's a yeah. it's a local VM it's chemo um and then I think maybe there's a PR for local Firecracker support but I don't think a whole lot of people care to locally run Firecracker. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. I I though at the same time I've had experience with uh, some apps that uh, running them uh, on Docker uh, on macOS is really a pain you actually would rather just move to a Linux machine. Yeah, yeah, we had a bunch of uh, issues with, uh, right, do Docker containers and support of the tool in macOS. Uh, hopefully most of those are fixed, but for sure, yeah. Um, so the, uh, it was a bit of a selfish interest as well because a bunch of the staff have uh, Macs. <laughs> so it's, that's also why. I can imagine. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, that was a good discussion. Yeah, thanks a yeah. lot for the questions. Awesome. You're making me feel bad about the my presentation for next week. Or two weeks from <laughs> now. Okay, so I think we could uh, open it for like um, open stage if anyone wants to add something because we don't have any other items on the agenda for today. Uh, I guess the obvious, if anybody is in force them, uh, it would be nice to meet in person for once. So yeah, me and Ma Mauro will be there. Uh, we posted the the talk we're presenting on the Slack channel. Uh, so yeah, we, we can we can discuss that on Slack if anybody is there. So yeah, if you have time, it would be awesome. <clears throat>
Yep. Yes, yeah, so I, I mentioned it on the Slack. Uh, two of my colleagues will be there. I'll, I'll send you the names. Uh, they'll be in this uh, dev room uh, at least for part of the time. So, you know, I'm in, all the Europe conferences that I only get to beg and plead to go to. Sorry, go ahead, Daniel. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to, to say that Tilo would be there also in the dev room, uh, but he couldn't attend. Uh, the like rolling strikes here in Germany, so last minute he had to go to his kid's school. Um, yeah. Did we get any um, update on the KubeCon EU uh, uh, session that we put in for? Did anybody hear anything on that? Yeah, it was uh, accepted. Good to hear that. Yeah, accepted, but we don't have any more information so far, right? No, pretty much. I think we have the... Um... In the schedule? No. Yeah, we are on Friday uh, around four something, which uh, I don't know if it's good or bad because it's really like almost the end of, of the whole conference. So after four days, I guess people might be a little bit tired, but uh, still uh, good to know that we have the time. I Yeah, you'll get people, but the people who are there really want to be there. You don't have everybody else's. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a very strong filter because I've been to the last two or three KubeCons and by uh, mid-Friday, a lot of people are gone. Yeah, it's like kind of uh, coll colliding with uh, travel time. Uh, not so. Yeah. Uh, we probably should, this is sort of a separate discussion, but I, we should probably spend a little bit of time together writing some of our own questions and kind of getting getting thoughts together, just in case there's a whole lot of silence. Um, I don't think we'll run out of things to talk about, given kind of how easily these conversations generally have gone, um, but it'll be good to have kind of some preceded stuff that, that we've already thought through. Yeah, maybe we could uh, start a doc and like share it in the um, channel and then like kind of, yeah, pull up some questions and topics into it. So we have some um, points to, to you know, kind of, kind of come back to if we run out of ideas after a busy KubeCon. Our panel is moderated by somebody, I don't remember, or is it self-coordinated? So the group decides how they structure the conversation. I guess it's I the same thing. There's a moderator, yeah. Uh, I mean, not not from KubeCon, for what I can tell. We can invent one then. <laughs> yeah. I think that's that's the route we'll probably wind, wind up wanting to go. Okay, I think we need a document to to put ideas on. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Cool. We have a couple ah, of okay. All right. So, Justin, are you ready for next week? Not at all. Not even close. Um, I also feel like like all of a lot of these are doing such neat and interesting things, and and costs is um, relatively speaking compared to unikernels and firecracker uh, boring. But I will absolutely present, and and we'll see. We we'll see what we come up with to talk about. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe the little moderator could join you next time. Yeah. Maybe so. I will actually be uh, well working from vacation um, for that week. So uh, be somewhere new. But otherwise, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Um, I guess the day after Valentine's Day, right? I guess so. I don't know. I'm in bed with that stuff. <laughs> I think it's the 15th. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, OK. Um, anything else that you want to bring while we are all here? We have a nice audience today. Are we still good with the time? I know there was some we time confusion in the last two sessions. You know, I, it's, I know it's tough to get worldwide coverage on this. Uh, I brought it up in the Slack channel, but uh, it's pretty hard for West Coast uh, North America uh, to come at 6 a.m. Uh, I don't know when. Uh, Go ahead. I think, sorry, I, I think a lot of folks are not like, I, it, I thought more more of us were over here on the West Coast, um, but I think uh, less than I thought. Um, and and so you know if if we want to kind of aim at at the majority, like I can get up at six. Um, 
it's going to be really hard because I'm going to be in, in Hawaii on the 15th. So I'll get up really early um, and, and present while sleepy and then go back to bed. Yeah, if you're in Hawaii, it's going to be 4 a.m. or 5 a.m.? Four, I think, something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we, it was like 7 a.m. is doable for the, the uh, West Coast. Um, 6 a.m. is tough. Like, I know my team wants to join, and they kind of said, I no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to join them. <laughs> uh, it takes a lot of effort to do that. I'm, I'm not on the, the West Coast, but um, so I, I don't know. It might be something we can think about um, going forward, and mm -hmm. maybe especially for Justin's in two weeks, 4 a.m. That, that's true. The, the, full, the whole cost team, um, almost. And the whole Bottle Rocket team almost are all West Coast. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I wasn't thinking about this sort of more more core group. But how does but, attendance look at the moment uh, in terms of uh, region and location? Don't know where everybody is, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's why I'm asking because I mean, for us in Europe, doing it a little bit later is still quite okay. Uh, I would say, but. If anyone is in Asia, I could understand that it might be a stretch. Yeah, it, it's, it's, there's no good answer here. You either disadvantage one part of the world and advantage another part of the world. So I, I don't want to like make it all about the West Coast or North America, but um, it is a hard swing for, for other people to join. So we're kind of have a self-selected group here. Um, basically, those yeah, yeah. who are... That's why I was asking if we know our numbers and, and maybe shift it depending on that. I mean, I could suggest that, like, maybe we open it up again for vote, uh, because, like, that's how we originally scheduled it. And I think the original thought was, like, finding the spot that kind of works for everyone. Like, I don't want to uh, single out, but uh, Sian is uh, joined here and is from, uh, joining from India. So that's, like, a bit, like, later in the evening for him. So I think we wanted to find a sweet spot, but we're not there yet. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would say the, the one difference is the time change when um, I think some people adopt daylight savings times, other don't. So before that, it was at a more approachable time. Um, and I don't know how, say, India is does with that. So it, we can kind of look at that. Yeah, pushing it would get much later. I understand that totally. I think the, the other challenge with the voting um, is so like right there's a, a whole team behind costs and i know there's a whole team behind bottle rocket too that are not actively involved in the in that in the channel on the, on the cncf slack and so you know like i'm happy to attend uh i've been struggling to attend sometimes here but partly because of the early time but also because of the small visitor who came by um but uh i think Figuring out, like, you know, I would love to have other people on the cost team be the ones who are presenting because I don't need to talk to all of you uh, and be good for them. But that's a hard sell, to, <laughs> so, sort of like Kyle was saying. But at the same time, like, like I, I want to figure out what the right what the right time is. I'm happy to get up at six. I, I'm happy to get up at, at four for one presentation. Like, I'm not going to get up at four every time. Um, but for, for mm -hmm. a one off, that seems fine. I have one more idea to suggest. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about it or would it be feasible, but perhaps uh, we have two meetings uh, per month. So perhaps one we could keep a bit earlier so APAC would be able to attend and then one later that would be more friendly for East, uh, West Coast. Not a bad idea in my opinion. Present the same topics you mean? Well, I mean, it's an open agenda, so like, possibly. Yeah. And we always have recordings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, sounds good to me. Yeah. So I think that's kind of meeting everyone in the middle somehow. Yeah. I mean, if we vary it one hour each way, so I guess currently this meeting starts at 7 30 p.m. New Delhi time based on the time chart that I gathered. Um, push it to like one meeting would push it to 8 30 p.m and 7 a.m and we keep it this way so you know if you have one meeting that cycles through the topics could probably be different but it just makes it a little easier for one group and a little harder for another group if you just vary it by even an hour it makes a, a pretty big impact 
Um, I don't think it would cut anybody off unless they're in maybe Tokyo. Then it's midnight. Yeah, yeah, that, that's hard to get everyone. <laughs> We've done, we need another slot, I guess. So, uh, so yeah, let's see your hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my thought is like, uh, so we did try, see a lot of the CNCF meetings are very uh, US time zone centric. So we did try to have a pack meetings uh, uh, to get uh, the pack crowd or like this, like right now Singapore is like the time is probably 11 p.m. Or, and if you go uh, more east, then it goes like midnight. So uh, like the Australian uh, people from Australia and all usually can't attend a uh, meeting. So, uh, so we tried to have a pack meetings, but the problem is uh, uh, what we faced was most of the time, uh, uh, the decisions happen in the U.S. meetings and uh, the APAC meeting ends up being of no use uh, and any decision that or discussion that is happening in the APAC meetings needs to be uh, relayed to the uh, actual meeting. So someone needs to be there uh, in those meetings as well. So I would suggest that. So there is no perfect way to get around this. I mean, uh, uh, but I would suggest like we could just alter every uh, biweekly, like one given is uh, biweekly, so we can have one uh, favorable for one, uh, the other one can be favorable to the other region. So something of that sort we can do. But yeah, I, I mean, uh, having two separate meetings, if we ever plan to, that's usually uh, not of good use because uh, you have uh, usually the folks who are taking those decisions will only attend one meeting and then uh, the other folks uh, would be, uh, there's no useful conversation happening in the other meeting. Now I feel a bit bad that I have missed some talks and I have the best time of all. Sorry, guys. Well, I don't know how to solve that one. <laughs> Uh, I guess the answer would be let's take it offline and vote. <laughs> we come up with some options and see what works for the majority because that's how we came with this time. But like, yeah, it's time zones are complicated. I think we should all move to Hawaii and then everybody will be happy, right? <laughs> that, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> if only. All right. Anything else that we should discuss? <clears throat> We'll wrap it up. Cool. So thank you all for your time and for a really nice group that showed up today. Uh, like to see that. And yeah, see you in two weeks. And before that, on the Slack. <laughs> see you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Ciao. Thank you. Bye bye.